Well, we've given everyone a little bit to join. It's a few minutes after three o'clock, so we'll go ahead and dive on in. For everyone who's joining us, hello and welcome to the Educational Leadership Series. My name is Lindsay Buckle, and I'll be our host for today. The Educational Leadership Series aims to educate and ensure the continued growth and evolution of game-based learning. The series will feature collaborations with the best and brightest minds to produce thought-provoking and educational content. Luckily for us and everyone here today, today's webinar will feature teacher and influencer Steve Isaacs as he discusses creating authentic learning experiences in the classroom. Before we go ahead and dive into Steve's presentation, I'd like to start off with a few housekeeping tips. First off, as you've probably noticed, your microphone will be muted. So please use the question and answer functionality found either at the top or bottom middle of your screen to ask any questions that arise during the presentation. All questions will be answered at the end of the slideshow. If you'd like to send in a chat, as a few of you have done already, the chat feature is also found either at the top or bottom middle of your screen. If you would like a certificate acknowledging your attendance at this call, feel free to email me at events at legendsoflearning.com and we'll send one over to you right away. And finally, this webinar will be recorded and available on our website after today's presentation. If you ever wanna go back, watch it again, or share it with your friends and colleagues. Before we get to Steve, let's go ahead and test out our chat functionality. Please send in your name and where you're from so we can get a sense of who has joined us today. I can go ahead and start. My name is Lindsay Buckle. I'm the manager of the Educational Leadership Series here at Legends of Learning, and I am tuning in from Washington, DC. We have Steve from New Jersey. Oh, Christopher, also from New Jersey. Let's see who else can find the chat. Oh, we have Josh from Maryland. Brian Sanders from Los Angeles. Thanks for tuning in, maybe at your lunch break. Susan from Georgia. Chris from Philadelphia. Nice, we got a very wide range of uh, locations joining us today, that's awesome. We have Kathy from New York, and Mike also from New York. Awesome. <clears throat> Perfect, well thanks so much for sharing where you're from. Um, now that we know who everyone is, let's go ahead and get this show on the road. First, I'm gonna go ahead and in introduce Steve. Steve has been teaching since 1992. In 1998, he began teaching at William Annan, where he developed an internationally recognized middle school game development program. Steve is a pioneer in using VR and AR in the classroom. As well, he's a champion for student choice, providing a choice-based environment to help students find and nurture their passion for learning. Steve is an ed tech influencer, community builder, and leader in game-based learning. He's actively involved in building the K-12 to college esports pipeline and co-founded the hashtag esports edu community. Steve was honored as the 2016 ISD Outstanding Teacher and the PBS Digital Innovator representing the state of New Jersey. So there's a few other people joining us from New Jersey today, so they probably already know you. <laughs> um, but Steve, please take it away. Thanks. Thanks, Lindsay. And um, thanks, everybody. Uh, thanks, Legends of Learning, for having me. Um, and yeah, so the, the topic of my talk, uh, because it is so near and dear to my heart, is about creating authentic learning experiences for our students. Um, I like to think that much of what I do has that focus at the center, uh, but I do find that I strive in in any opportunity that I have to truly make um, opportunities real for my kids. And, and hopefully that'll come across through my presentation. Um, you know, Lindsay had mentioned that I teach, uh, you know, I've created a choice or quest based learning environment. So for the past, gosh, number of years, um, it's interesting too, I'll, I'll, I'll backtrack a little bit. Um, you know, I teach game design and development in a middle school. Uh, and a high school now. This is the first year we brought the program to our high school, which is something I've wanted to do for a long time. 
Um, and that provides a great opportunity for me to expand the program and, and the reach um, into our high school community as well. Uh, and I actually started my career in special education in a school for, um, well, actually in a, in a science and technology magnet school, um, which my class was housed in only because there was room, um, not because of the realization that my kids could certainly benefit from the resources. Uh, but that got me into using, you know, ed tech and seeing about personalized learning and providing opportunities for my kids to learn. And, and that started a lot of my interest in, in game-based learning and seeing how that really worked with my students. Um, and then my wife and I opened a computer training and soon to be gaming center in Liberty Corner, New Jersey, a little, uh, well, the town where I now teach essentially. Uh, but our, it was a really neat opportunity because our goal from the beginning was to provide creative opportunities um, or teach, you know, technology in creative ways or creative uses for technology. And because it was a private business, we had a lot of flexibility. And the main, you know, thing there was make sure that we uh, got people to register and in the door. And it turned out at the time that um, we found a really nice mix often with games and learning because it appealed to both the kids and then the way we pitched it to parents about the learning side of it um, kind of kept everybody happy. And it, it really, um, and this is going back to like 1995, and uh, it created a really neat environment for kids. Uh, we got into things like game design and web design there. Um, we also started, um, I always love this part of the story in that we, internet cafes were kind of a thing then. So my wife and I thought it would be a great idea to open on weekend evenings as an internet cafe. And it was great in that my wife and I got to spend many a Friday and Saturday night um, essentially by ourselves, sipping coffee and surfing the internet. And um, while it was not good from a business plan perspective, um, you know, it was fun to have a place to hang out for us, at least with fast internet. Uh, but soon we started to invite kids that maybe missed a class to come in um, in the evenings to make up that time. And before we knew it, this one day came and it was like the strangest thing. Like, you know, we'd have a, a kid here and there. And then all of a sudden one night, um, car after car after car dropped their kids off at our door um, with each parent coming in to, you know, pay for their kids to spend two, three hours uh, playing games on our network with their friends. Um, parents were very smart. They realized this was a unique opportunity for them to go out to dinner and have their kids, you know, in a safe place that they wanted to be. Um, and that just grew to this amazing sort of affinity space community for kids in our town, um, which led to so many neat activities and, and even got into things like competitive gaming and things um, which, you know, kind of all these things fall into place for my story as it goes on. Um, and then I got the job where I am now at William Anna Middle School, uh, you know, hired kind of because of some of these innovative ideas about technology and then, but I was still teaching fairly traditional computer classes. Um, until I started to see opportunities for kids to make their own games and have this as an after school program. And then part of our gifted and talented program and ultimately pitched to create a full semester elective class. And ever since then, um, I've essentially exclusively been teaching game design. Um, but from the standpoint of the quest based learning part, um, and this screen you're looking at shows you a little bit of class craft if anybody's familiar. Um, and feel free to type stuff in the chat. I have the little window open. Um, but the, the idea here is that I provide a lot of different learning paths for my kids that all essentially lead to the same learning outcomes. Um, in my class, a lot of it's about iterative design. So kids are creating games, but they're designing their game, they're building their game, they're testing their games or having peers test their games and give feedback. and regardless of kind of some of these learning paths, that's one of the main learning outcomes. Um, in the class, they also do a lot with um, learning about games by playing games and analyzing games and, and uh, writing reviews and that sort of thing. So there are all these different paths that converge and, and they have a lot of different, they have a lot of autonomy and choice, whether it be through which quest line they choose or 
when they're creating their game, what tool they use. Because um, as far as I'm concerned, the tool that they choose to make their game with is not the important part. It's the process. And that also gives them a lot of autonomy in terms of choosing and, and owning their learning. Um, my kids often have to learn the tool because I'm not an expert at the 30 or so different um, possible tools to make games. Um, and I love for them to learn and to, uh, to sit and learn with them often. Um, so this is kind of an example of one of our quest lines too at the beginning of the year that most kids participate in because this is where we play a lot of games, analyze them and write reviews um, for them. And this is kind of what the, our final game looks like. Um, every kid does participate in creating a final game, generally speaking with a team, but that's up to them. And they go through a process that really follows the iterative design process. And the way, to give you a little clarity too, you're seeing my screen. When a kid starts a quest line, like they might just see this introduction. And then once they complete that, it'll open up maybe one other quest or after this one, it might open three strands. Um, but the kids, kind of like a game, like if you've played Warcraft 2 or Starcraft or those kind of um, real-time strategy games, there's something called Fog of War in a game where you only see the part of the game that you're supposed to see, or, not, or the part that you've revealed so far, I should say. So in this case, they don't see all of this. They only usually see what they've completed and what's next you know, that's available to them. And actually, if I go back to like this part, this is like at the beginning, they can choose any one of these quest lines to start with and then can kind of advance along the way with those. So, you know, bringing it back to just the notion of game-based learning as, well, for one, in line with this talk on authentic experiences, um, I find that when kids learn through games, uh, they the experiential approach and is, is where the learning is often embedded right in the game and they're experiencing the Oregon Trail rather than, you know, in Westward Expansion, rather than reading about it in a textbook, which I find valuable. Um, anybody here, give me a quick shout out if you've, you know, played this game. I, I think you probably have. Um, it's, a, it's funny too, because I think when it comes to Oregon Trail, um, you know, I, when I was a student, probably in eighth, ninth, grade this game was out so you know we think about game-based learning as something new and it's not really anything new at all uh the card version you have also yeah we we got that recently um which was quite fun and i still love oregon trail too what's kind of cool is all of my kids one of the quests is called westward ho and just about every kid in my class ends up um playing that and writing a review about it and i love seeing their thoughts on that because it shows kind of how it stood up stood the test of time you know yeah damn snake bites and uh of course uh cholera and all sorts of other wonderful um dysentery yeah we love all that um you know and then a number of years ago i i was um introduced to the folks at um at legends of learning imagine they're they're uh, our sponsor or you know uh you know running this series but one of the things that i really loved about legends of learning from the beginning for one is that they're taking an interesting approach to providing a variety of games for a variety of topic areas and really going for sort of bite-sized games often so that if there's a certain skill you're trying to teach, there's probably a game in their library for that. Um, and I think sometimes with game-based learning, we run into a challenge where, you know, like a game like Civilization, as awesome as it is for teaching history and such, is a pretty broad game. Um, their approach has been to like, let's say we want to teach these different skill areas. We can do that in a, in a way that focuses on that area. The other thing I really appreciated about Legends of Learning from the beginning is that the way they went about um, curating their games is that they had, they basically, it was almost like an open call to developers to create educational games following these standards and, and such. But then what they did is they took a ton of teacher input. Um, I early on was able to beta test and, and give feedback and things. So that was a real valuable thing that, that I always valued in Legends of Learning is that they you know, looked to the teachers, looked to the students, and essentially 
started to create a, a rating system because um, <laughs> we all know, or I am certain to know that there are a lot of bad games for education out there. And it's really important to find a way to um, figure out which ones, you know, hold value. Um, so hopefully as the system has evolved, so has the rating system and, and all of that. Um, I, I love this picture, um, not just because it's my daughter, but this was a transformational point in my um, sort of, I guess, way I looked at education. Um, anybody know, I'll give you a quick second to, to type it in. Anybody know what she's doing here? I'll take a little sip of my coffee while I give you a little wait time. Mm. Come on, let's see. DNA, it looks like DNA. I, I'd like to go with that because she's about probably eight years old there and it would be great if um, she was learning about DNA. Um, not quite, and maybe I'm dating myself a little bit too, or my family, but um, a number of years ago, there was something called Rainbow Loom, uh, which was all the rage. And my daughter, um, like many kids, loved creating, and they had all these, you know, it was all about different patterns to make these uh, rubber band connected bracelet things in this loom. And here she is doing what kids do, um, is they learned online, in this case, YouTube. She's pausing a video as she needs to. She's learning what she needs to, to do this, whatever stitch, masterfully and that's she's learning she's like learning in an informal space now this is so important to me because what i've found is that um and i hope we're getting over it a little bit but i think it's pretty clear that this is how kids learn and i think it's also often the thing where we the kids learn this way at home and then they come into school and our attitude is kind of like oh but we don't do it that way here well, we certainly should be doing it that way here. And this is, um, this is learning at its core. And this is personalized learning. And this is her finding a passion, which has become, it's become my passion to help my students find their passion. Um, and, you know, she's learning as she goes. Um, so I, I hope you enjoy that picture. Um, too bad she's not here to be embarrassed. Uh, it's about eight years ago or so. Um, then, you know, other things that have happened that, uh, that have come out of, you know, sort of giving kids opportunities. Um, and this, this I just love. Um, <laughs> so, you know, I, I used uh, the 20% time model, or now it's almost become my 100% time model in a sense with the choice-based um, approach. But early on, um, you know, I had, we called it, I think, 20% Tuesday. And on Tuesdays, my kids would um, be able to work on whatever their passion project was. Um, so we were using Game Maker Studio at the time. I don't know if anybody's used it here. Great tool for making games. Also great because it has a very intuitive drag and drop interface, which still models good syntax in terms of like, you know, learning programming concepts. Um, but there's also a full programming language behind it called GML or Game Maker Language. So... I had a student, Brian, who was um, really dug into this. And I, you know, be, because I tweet a lot and all those kinds of things, people knew that I used Game Maker pretty extensively. So I was um, approached by this publisher, Pact Publishing. And they had asked me if I would be interested or, you know, in writing a book on Game Maker, on, on game maker language. Now, to be completely transparent, um, my immediate reaction was, there's no way I can write this book. I don't have the skills to do it. Um, fortunately, I thought for a few minutes and I thought of Brian and I said to the publisher, I said, um, you know, I have an eighth grader who's, you know, just devouring this language and learning it. I said, he's very capable. I said, I'd be happy to co-write it with him, you know, clearly with me taking more of an editorial role and um, lucky, for me, I think, and for Brian, they were willing to um, to allow us to co-write this book. So quite honestly, um, Brian, you know, was the lead author without a question. 
um, I was happy that I could at least test a lot of the code and and you know do some you know editing. But um, I, I joke because um, I think I was 48 at the time, and this was my first you know published book, and I published it with a kid who got to have the same claim you know that his first book was published when he was 14. Um, very excited about that. And ISTE highlighted this because it really went into the ISTE standards for students, um, which I believe very strongly. And if you ever take a look at them, they're all about empowering kids and creating opportunities for kids. So along the same lines in terms of um, students um, putting stuff out there, um, almost every project my kids do, and if you follow me on Twitter, hopefully you're not, um, hopefully you still enjoy all of the tweets I, I, when I share student work. But when, when a student does something that I, you know, want to share out, it's, you know, a blog post that I just post the link to. So I share a lot of student work um, because I want them writing for an authentic audience. Um, so here are a couple examples of blog posts, but almost every project or assignment my kids do results in a blog post reflection. Um, interestingly, this one on the left was great. So, um, and I, so four years ago, um, as an eighth grader, I had this boy Spencer in class and I only <laughs> made the connection a few days ago that I have him now in my high school class as a senior. I knew I recognized Spencer, but I forgot the connection of this story until he went back and uh, just posted a blog post yesterday um, reflecting on this year's class. And he referred back to his eighth grade project, which was this one on the left. So Spencer was this super nice kid, but was really just didn't seem so engaged in my class in eighth grade. And we were starting to dabble with virtual reality and stuff. And I shared that I had got this program called No Limits Coaster that you could create roller coasters, um, you know, using a CAD-like system in um, VR for non-VR, or you could ride these coasters in virtual reality. It just so happened this kid had this program at home, but with no connection to the VR part. He got so excited. Um, and on my class YouTube channel, if you get a chance, um, I'd love for you to watch his final video. His final video is a video set to music that um, takes you through his whole amusement park that he created as his final project. So he went from, you know, being a little bit disaffected to like, like, ooh, I'm going to dig in. And, and this kid, Spencer, it was so awesome. Almost every day, he'd say to me, you know, can I bring in so-and-so for lunch? You know, a kid that's not in our class so he could ride my roller coaster. And it was, it was tremendous. Um, and again, you know, just, you know, comes out of the opportunities that we provide. And, and I think in this case, it's like, you know, my, one of my goals is like to have a whole lot of resources available to kids and let them, you know, see where they take, take them. And uh, this was a great example of that. So I mentioned earlier, I think the iterative design process, which sort of is at the foundation of my the game design teaching I do. Um, you know, all my kids, one of the things they 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 certainly can reflect upon by the end is this process where they, you know, go from designing a game or creating a design document, developing the game, or at least the first iteration, a lot of play testing and refining, um, you know, which is very interesting for kids because they always are fairly certain that their game should make sense to their audience until they watch somebody else play it and do things not the way they thought they should be done or not as well as they thought they should be done. And, um, and then ultimately to publish a game. So my goal for kids always is that the end game is that they, they publish um, something that can be shared. And we have a lot of games and things out there as a result. Um, you know, we've also started last year, and this is another one of these examples just of, of sort of, you know, empowering kids. Um, Fortnite came out with creative mode maybe a couple of years ago now, or at least definitely last year, if not the year before. And for my, when kids in my class create um, their own game, generally speaking, they can choose whatever tool they'd like. Um, I hadn't offered up Fortnite initially and sort of had my reservations, not my reservations, but sort of the world, <laughs> thinking of the world view. And because Fortnite 
is seen as like a, you know, a shooter game and whatnot. You know, I just, especially for my eighth graders, I wasn't sure how that would go over. So I was waiting for the question to come and it came last year. I had a few kids say, can we create our game in Fortnite Creative? So I was kind of anticipating this and I said, I'll tell you what, I feel like we should get permission from the administration. I said, how about if you guys write a letter to our principal, I'll support you and, you know, help, help you in terms of writing it. Um, but I think, you know, let's go that route and sort of provide, you know, a good case for why it's valuable. You know, it's the, the reality is, and as you can see here, the game, the thing you're seeing right here is actually what a lot of my kids create this year, which is Rube Goldberg machines in Fortnite creative. That's one of the projects that I have them do and they can do it in Minecraft also. But um, last year, um, the, hey David, um, last year, you know, I had these kids write this email, you know, they framed it like, you know, we have the option to use a variety of tools. Any of them can, I mean, I could create a gun to put in the player's hand in Game Maker, or I could, likewise, I could choose not to and use guns in Fortnite because I know what is and isn't appropriate for school. Um, they even went as far as saying, and we'll even get permission from our parents, which they did. My principal, I give her a whole lot of credit because her main concern initially was COPA and FERPA and um, Epic Games, if you read their, their um, EULA and such, they do follow, luckily follow, um, you know, the privacy requirements and such. So it's become hugely popular for my kids to create with Fortnite Creative and Fortnite Creative is an amazing tool for kids to teach, to, to create their own games, to create things like this Rube Goldberg project. And Epic, I'm super happy to, to report, is very much behind education right now. And they're even uh, sponsoring a contest where, and, and I tweet about it all the time, where um, teachers can submit lesson plans that use some of their interactive 3D tools, like either Fortnite Creative, Twin Motion, which is a visualization tool, or Unreal Engine, um, which is a full-on game design engine, um, probably the premier one, in fact. It's what Fortnite's made in. Um, and they're, they have a huge contest right now for educators to submit with big prizes and stuff. Uh, and they're just super excited about supporting education, which I couldn't be happier about. Um, Minecraft has been another one that my kids have just loved. And this came the same way, I mean, about, gosh, maybe... 10, well, Minecraft's out a little over 10 years, maybe eight years ago, I had kids starting to, um, let's see, do you know if Fortnite is New York Ed Law to be compliant? Uh, that I don't know, the whole sharing of student information. Well, remember, that's the same kind of stuff, Kathy, like what we're talking about with at least COPA and FERPA, COPA and FERPA. So I'm hoping it's the same kind of requirements. Um, but so Minecraft, Again, I had kids start asking, can we use Minecraft to make our game? And at the time that happened, I knew very little about Minecraft. And that was one of the first times, that was another transformational moment in my career when I learned that um, I could really turn to my students um, and, and allow them to be the expert. And again, me guide the process. Um, that was huge for me because that was the first time I really, really did that. And... So what happened was, um, you know, I had certain kids who would teach me enough. I was open-ended enough in the assignment um, to allow them to own what they were going to create. They still created a design document and everything. Um, and then I even had a kid who happened to be um, manage his own server and was willing to manage a server for us. And he taught me all about the server. And anytime I needed something to happen on the server, I would ask him and he would go home, figure it out, come in the next day and show me and, and do it. So again, hugely powerful experience for this kid and these other kids who, you know, were the experts in this area. Um, I had one student this marking period find her own game development uh, or game engine called Cray, uh, C-R-E-Y. I encourage you to check it out. It's still in early access, brand new, free. Um, it's a beautiful environment. She um, decided to do this, learned it, created her game with Cray. 
created a video that um, she submitted as part of her final project as like a trailer or walkthrough. Um, I tweeted that out before. <laughs> Take a look at it. It's really great. And um, again, you know, it's like this whole idea where she's able to take ownership. Uh, we got really involved in virtual reality a number of years ago. So, you know, my kids are, are working on creating their own content in XR. So virtual reality and augmented reality. Um, I got involved uh, with, you know, a project with Verizon and Games for Change um, with some great sponsors. And we do hackathons um, around the country over the next two years. We've done maybe four so far or five, and we have about 15 more coming. Um, and we're doing these hackathons in, in communities with, you know, for underserved kids. And the kids are being given these problems around um, thinking about design thinking, thinking about what's possible with 5G technology and you know, and things like virtual reality and augmented reality, and they're coming up with prototypes and um, spending a day at a hackathon learning some of these tools like CoSpaces and Merge Cube and such, and um, and creating, you know, a prototype in a day, which has been phenomenal to watch. Um, it's been really exciting. Uh, here's another, you know, another opportunity some of my students had. Uh, Games for Change or XR for Change was having something called their XR for Change Talk and Play. And we showcased a couple of my students' projects, um, one that was um, an augmented reality project and one that was a VR project. So these kids decided with VR to create a game they called Trapped in the Dungeon, a Minecraft VR adventure. Um, it was super cool to have watch these kids develop this game because what they did um, is, you know, it, Minecraft's available in VR for the Windows 10 version of Minecraft. So I would have a team of three. Two of them were in regular Minecraft building. The third one was in VR, um, giving immediate feedback to his, to his uh, teammates. So things like if a staircase was too narrow and that didn't work for VR, they were understanding the affordances and the importance of designing for virtual spaces. So they, you know, the one who was in the game in virtual reality would relay to the partners what they had to do to kind of fix this up. And it was a really neat experience for just getting a sense of how to design for this new medium, uh, which was certainly cool. Another opportunity my kids had, um, this is a neat story. Um, I had three students in eighth grade, uh, I guess, three year, two years ago, um, yeah, two years ago, and they really took to working in Unity and VR. And I, um, you know, I was excited by this because Unity is tough for eighth graders. So I always allow kids to try, but, um, you know, we've had limited successes at least so far with um, that grade level, but these kids really took to it. So when they were already in ninth grade and I was still at the middle school, we had an opportunity to work with a company called Zenial Digital, who specifically wanted to work with students on a design team to um, work on content creation for virtual reality. So the kids had this opportunity to both get in these meetings. There's a Zoom meeting with the developers. They met weekly. They were given the source code. They were um, one of the groups. There was another school we worked with. They were a little younger. And they were doing a lot of research on bats because we were doing a VR uh, experience with bats. And then my kids were coming up with new ideas to enhance the experience, but also going in there and coding in Unity to try to um, create their own, you know, modifications to this. And, uh, and hopefully we'll continue working with Xenial Digital. They're really a phenomenal group. And that idea that they knew they wanted to really reach out and um, impact students was uh, something that I was super excited about. Um, also, you know, in terms of, you know, authentic opportunities, I love to have kids out there presenting. Um, this is Brian and Jason. And Brian, <laughs> I don't know if you saw um, our bit on our, our piece on CBS Sunday morning, but Brian was featured on CBS Sunday morning. Um, he's your, he's an interesting kid, super great kid. Um, not not academically inclined or not, I should say, not traditionally, you know, speaking, 
Um, but when he was given the opportunity to make games in my uh, eighth grade class, he <laughs> was bringing his work home with him. He was doing homework, you know, working on this at home, wasn't doing work for his other classes, um, which <laughs> was an interesting uh, thing to kind of consider with his parents because the question became like, should we encourage this or shouldn't we if he's not, you know, all that kind of stuff. But he did a phenomenal job, found his passion. And he and Jason had an opportunity to present at Mind Fair. In fact, I live in Jersey. Brian came out with us to the Los Angeles show and presented there and was filmed while he was there by CBS Sunday Morning, who then came into our classroom as well. Um, this isn't the kind of experience that this kid typically has in school, you know? So that was, um, again, one of these like opportunities that I thought was really neat to be able to provide or find something that really spoke to him that he excelled at and was like, you know, really took to uh, beyond, you know, extreme. Um, here's another one of my students, uh, Tim, who's presented um, at one of our other Mind Fair events. Um, he did one of the Rube Goldberg projects I was talking about in Minecraft and really did a phenomenal job of, um, you know, kind of covering things like what we were going for, which was simple machines and things like that in Minecraft. And he got to share this with this full house um, at this event. Uh, so that was cool. And here we are on CBS Sunday morning. That was one of the, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> uh, highlights of my career. And that's Brian again. Um, now, when we talk about, you know, also um, authentic opportunities, uh, I've been hugely involved in esports for the past few years. And my middle school, we started a game club, which um, kind of brought me back to recreating that situation I described that we had it at our game center, where we created a space, an affinity space for like minded kids who often didn't have that other kind of activity to go to. They weren't necessarily the sports kids. Many of them um, have ha happened to be, you know, special needs or on the spectrum, and but they happen to love games, and this was where they wanted to be, and um, the community that's developed has been great. Um, then I really wanted to also uh, start, we started competing. If you know Chris Aviles, he luckily called me at my middle school and said, hey, Let's, um, can you pull together a team to play Rocket League? So once I, they realized they could play against another school, they got you know, immediately excited and that sort of brought it to the next level at our middle school. And then at our high school, we started right out of the gate as a competitive esports team and we've had great success. Last year, um, two of our League of Legends teams made it to the semifinals in, the, in our division. This year, our, and this is a picture here of our, um, uh, our Overwatch team who came in first in the East and then came in, I believe, fourth nationally. Um, but, you know, some of the opportunities that come of this, I have the uh, picture there of the folks who are sort of broadcasting or shoutcasting. We've had students start to learn, you know, shoutcasting or announcing games. That's a big part of it. There are so many roles outside of the player that allow for a whole ecosystem around esports that I think creates tons of opportunities. And these are opportunities in a, in a business that's growing, you know, in an industry that's growing faster than we can even imagine. So, you know, we're creating these opportunities. Um, there's an organization, NACEF, which you see here, the North American Scholastic Esports Federation, and they offer a lot of neat things. Like they offer coaching that we can take advantage of. They um, offer leagues that, that our students have participated in. Um, they offer workshops and things and, and also um, curriculum. So there are a number of schools that are actually using a, an esports curriculum during their school day. So some of these, there's a, a, a high school language arts curriculum for years that threads um, esports in throughout as, as the content, but there's, the kids are still doing the same standards um, in terms of what they're learning and, and, and demonstrating, but with the lens of something that they're excited about, which is esports in this case. Um, here are some uh, ways you can sort of follow some of the work too. Uh, I've been compiling a number of Wakelet um, resources. If you're not familiar with Wakelet, it's a great way to uh, collect resources and share them. 
what I tend to do is use it as like a student showcase. So these blog posts that I talk of, when a kid creates one that's worth kind of cataloging, I put them in one of my weekly groups and you can always see a, a wide variety of work um, from my students. Uh, we have a YouTube channel there that a lot of the kids' YouTube videos are up on, especially those Rube Goldberg projects I was talking about. Um, Twitter, <laughs> you can definitely find me on Twitter. And I started streaming um, from my class uh, last, maybe the end of last year, definitely been doing it a lot this year um, on Twitch. So a lot of times I'll tweet out in the morning when we're going to go live and you could join us and, and watch what we're doing, you know, kind of get a glimpse into my classroom um, and also interact with us. Uh, I love it when people who know more than I do join our Twitch stream and as we're doing things in Minecraft or Fortnite Creative and you know, they can contribute and it's like having a guest um, expert joining us. Um, those QR codes should get you some of these places as well. And I believe that is my last slide, which gives us, I hope, plenty of time for questions and answers. Um, so I guess, Lindsay, do you come back on now? It looks like it. Yes, absolutely. Thank you so much, Steve. My pleasure. Yeah, that was really fascinating. Um, I especially enjoyed the roller coaster story <laughs> with the student bringing his friends in to kind of ride it at lunch. Yeah, um, such cool. a great example of collaboration and ownership um, that game development brings students. So Thanks. thank you for your presentation and all those examples. Um, we are going to start the question and answer session now. So if you have any questions, please click the question and answer button at the top or bottom of your screen and type in your question. I'll read them to Steve and then he will go ahead and answer them. As you guys are writing in your questions, um, I'd just love to say a word about Legends of Learning. Um, Steve mentioned us a little bit during his presentation, but as a math and science game-based learning platform, Legends of Learning strives to be on the cutting edge of new game-based learning strategies and techniques. Backed by research on efficacy from Vanderbilt University, we endeavor to not only be leaders in our fields, but also to inform and inspire leaders across our industry. So in that pursuit, we have created the educational leadership series to explore the latest advances, current and projected trends, and solutions to the issues affecting education today. We have monthly webinars, as well as in-person events, including co-sponsoring a game-based learning summit on February 7th in Baltimore, Maryland. Thank you, Steve, for being a great part of our series. Now, on to questions. The first one that we have here is, how do you see K-12 esports interacting, if at all, with K-12 in-class curriculum? What a great question. So, um, so there is full-on curriculum that's being developed for esports um you know so you could find that online there's a group out of i think kansas as well as nasep that has curriculum there are a few other um maybe things as well personally um for me and it, you know i've been looking at it more as an extracurricular but that's because i'm also looking at it as like on par with a varsity sports program and trying to build it to that level as well as the ancillary um, activities. So when you look at things like video editing, um, uh, you know, podcasting, broadcasting, uh, you know, even journalism in esports, there are so many curricular tie-ins, um, even strategizing and, and theory crafting and things. So there's so much there. Um, and it just, you know, becomes a, a question of do you bring it in where it fits into your specific curriculum or do you adopt a curriculum that has that focus, but um, I see a lot of both happening, um, including the seeing it more as an extracurricular, but even in the extracurricular, you have so much of the, these extra opportunities, so it brings in more than just the competitive gamer, without a doubt. Awesome. Um, we also have a comment here from Adam that says, um, the NASEF has curriculum that they will share yep. with inter interested educators for elementary through high school that has been tied to content standards. Yeah, and all free. Everything through NASEP is free. They're well-funded and incredibly supportive. Um, I am so grateful, you know, for the work that they're doing. Absolutely, thanks. 
Mm -hmm. um, next question, have you seen any changes in a school's or district's graduation outcomes as a result of focus on ed tech or game-based learning? So, so that's a, a good question from a, from a research standpoint. Um, I will say there are definitely statistics out there that talk to the idea that kids that are involved in like esports, um, you know, it's one of those things like, you know, how the like kids that are involved in traditional sports, you notice that a lot of them will have better attendance and things and, and even better grades because it's important to them to be able to participate in these activities. Esports is definitely seeing that. I personally think game-based learning, like, you know, I teach game design and, and I have had situations at least where people would say that the, um, their kids are getting to school on time because they don't want to miss first period if that's when they're taking it with me. So things like that. But um, I do believe there's such positive um, things. I just, I'm not a researcher. I'm, you know, more a practitioner. So I don't have all of those statistics, you know, to just rattle at you. But, but I, I do see positive influence for sure. Awesome. Thanks, Eve. Um, the next question how do you get started with an esports team in a really small school with a supportive superintendent and BOE? What game would you start with? Yeah, good question again. Wow, great stuff. Um, so a couple of ways you could look at that. If you have the support of administration, gosh, that's just, that's just wonderful. I think we're getting there so much more. I'm starting to see more even superintendents saying to their to teachers, we want to start an esports program where it used to all come the other way. Um, you know, if budget is a big concern, I always say you can start with a Nintendo Switch and a few extra controllers, even kids bringing it in themselves. Super Smash Brothers Ultimate is a great competitive uh, eSport that kids just love. So it's popular all the way through from elementary through high school. Um, we've had great success in the middle school with Rocket League uh, because it's, you know, there's nothing, um, you know, objectionable about it. It's soccer with cars. Um, Minecraft is on the rise with competitive gaming. I'm surprised it's taken this long, but we have a group we're working with called Comp MC, who run a um, competitive Minecraft uh, game called Capture the Wool, which is like Capture the Flag. So think of any super competitive esports, but in Minecraft where you know we've already kind of gotten you know fairly reasonable approval about using Minecraft. Then the other thing I don't want to let go unnote, unstated is that the issues and, and, and questions around diversity and inclusion are huge and game selection when we can should, uh, well, not when we can, it really should um, think about that. Like if you've um, ever heard or, or, or seen, you know, the work that Jay Collins is doing, he'll, they'll share that um, at their all girls school, you know, something like Just Dance is a hugely popular game. It also has the ability to be very competitive. So, you know, it, it's worth noting, like, or thinking about why we do or don't have fair representation of, you know, all genders and, 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 and um, diverse groups. So I would keep that in there also. Yeah, absolutely. Great point, Steve. Um, the next question is, um, it's great to help kids learn with video games. But how can I also incorporate the benefits of gaming into my classroom when they aren't playing digital video games? Oh, you, you, um, well, so in my class, in, at least in my game design class, um, we start with uh, tabletop games in the high school class and kids analyze and learn game mechanics from non-digital games. That's one thing. There's also some amazing, um, you know, I remember, it's funny, my... I think it was eighth grade. So I had two experiences in like eighth grade that I always forgot about until I realized that what an influence it had on me. Um, there was a, a paper and pencil tabletop based uh, game that we played to learn about diplomacy and such. And similar to John Hunter's uh, World Peace game, but I, this was, I think, created by the my social studies teacher. We also did a um, stock market game that back then we didn't have spreadsheets and such to analyze everything. So we were keeping our portfolios, you know, by hand and things. And that was, was really great too. So i um, not sure if that's answering the question, but it definitely, um, there's such a huge space and a huge resurgence of tabletop and, and card-based games. And I think 
the things that we can learn from them, you know, are, are great. So I don't think it has to be digital games by any means. Awesome. Perfect. Um, and I think this is the last question that's come in so far. Um, what are some ways I can use game-based learning in a curriculum aligned manner in my classroom? So that's, <laughs> that's the million dollar question, but it's actually, I do have an answer. Um, so, you know, I'm going to bring Minecraft up for a moment and similarly like Fortnite creative in that they're both sandbox games. Um, one thing that a lot of teachers have had great success with, even if they weren't teaching through games directly is when they allow kids to use games to demonstrate their understanding. So like perfect example is um, my wife, I always bring her up with this. She used to teach um, technology at an elementary school. And the project that some of her teachers were doing year after year after year was having kids create a brochure about like, let's say um, the uh, endangered species or national parks. And the brochure followed this like template that it was like, okay, put, you know, the title here, put a picture here, give a paragraph, you know, and it drove my, my wife bananas. Um, so she started to bring in other opportunities for kids. Now, if a kid desperately wants to create a brochure, by all means, let that kid create a brochure. But if we give opportunities, like let's say we, we allow the kids to use Minecraft to demonstrate um, their understanding of an endangered species, kids are going to blow you away with what they can do. And you don't have to be the expert at the game to allow them to use it. You know, and the same rubric could probably apply if, if you have your learning outcomes there clearly. So that's one approach. Um, and Minecraft has been tremendous because it's been used in amazingly creative ways by teachers in every content area you can imagine. Um, you can go to the Minecraft education site, um, education.minecraft.net to see some of those lesson plans. And lesson plans are also coming about um, through the Epic um, you know, through their Teach with Interactive 3D program. So a lot of these programs have, you know, um, and those are spanning a variety. Like my Rube Goldberg project, I use it with my game design students because it has them start automating things in Fortnite Creative. But I wrote the lesson plan to teach simple machines and, um, you know, science and engineering principles. Uh, so I think, there's, I think there's a wide net there. And it's just a matter of, of seeing you know where you know what you're teaching can be supported with games yeah absolutely that was such a great answer really allowing no matter what subject area which grade level you teach to have a way to use game-based learning in your classroom thanks so that is the last question that we received so kind of wraps up our discussion for today um, again a really big thank you to steve isaacs for joining us if anyone has any additional questions, please feel free to email me at events at legendsoflearning.com. Um, and I can even forward those on to Steve if they're for Steve specifically. <laughs> um, thank you once again for joining our educational leadership series. Our next webinar is on February 20th, Robotics, Virtual Reality, and the Future of Project-Based Learning with Dan White. Oh, awesome. Yeah. Now, is that Dan White, like Dan White from Filament Games, Dan White? That is Dan White from Filament Games, Dan White. Don't miss that, folks. <laughs> yeah, we're very, very excited to have him. Cool, cool. Well, thanks, everybody, and, and thanks, Lindsay. Yes, absolutely. I hope everyone has a wonderful rest of your Tuesday.